All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the library. It's great to see you. Um, this talk today is part of our series on the novel Frankenstein. Um, every year for our One Book, One College program, we pick a book um, and we uh, discuss themes and uh, issues that that book brings up to us. Sometimes we actually talk about the book itself. Sometimes we talk about related themes. And today um, may cross over into the book, but it's also gonna touch on some of the themes in terms of research ethics, and specifically thinking about artificial intelligence, which um, were, if you, if you believe, um, the people that know out there were on the verge of really big changes with AI and how it will impact our world. To help us think about these topics, uh, we are very honored and grateful that uh, Jack, Dr. John Murphy has joined us today, um, does work in computer science, also some anthropology training too, right? That's, you had mentioned a little bit. Other way around. Other way around. Anthropologist with some work in computer science, perhaps. Uh, works at Argonne National Lab, which is just up the road near Lamont, Illinois. I'm really um, grateful that he's giving us um, his time as someone that really is thinking deeply and at the edge of some of the things that are on the way. So I'm excited to hear what he has to teach us. Uh, thank you all for coming. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Murphy. Thank you again. Am I on? Excellent. Did I hear that there's like a College 101 course here? I assume that's that sort of an orientation, how to navigate college, that sort of thing. I remember taking that myself. I won't mention what year. Totally failed it. Uh, don't do what I did. Um, but you're here, and the reason I failed it is I didn't go to this stuff. Um, so i um, very happy to be here. Um, I guess I can start off with who I am. Um, and honestly, I'm a little bit weird, um, and I'm in a weird spot, and Argonne is a great place for being weird and in a weird spot. So who am I? Um, I do have a PhD. I also have a master's degree in education. Um, my PhD is actually archaeology and anthropology. Um, uh, technically, archaeology is a subfield of anthropology, so I shouldn't have to list them both, but um, many people don't know that. Um, my specialties, though, are computational social science, long-term adaptation to climate change, urban form and social structure, and social complexity. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, I use computers to model how complex societies, cities, change over time, um, and how we might learn from the past, the way cities changed over centuries in the archaeological record, to understand how we might do better in the future. Um, I am officially a computational engineer at Argonne National Laboratory. Um, I also hold several other positions, um, the Consortium for Advanced Science and Engineering at UChicago, uh, Northwestern Argonne Institute for Advanced Science and Engineering. Um, I hold a research specialist position right now at University of Illinois, Chicago, and I am affiliated with uh, Northern Illinois University. Um, I was a research associate professor there until June, Funding is weird, now I'm not moving on. Um, one thing I do want to say is that the views and opinions in this presentation are my own and do not represent Argonne or any other institution of the US federal government, et cetera, et cetera. So I am free to say what I want, and Argonne um, is not being uh, implicated. So for example, if I misspell Northwestern, it's not Argonne's fault. Uh, so um, I want to mention what anthropology is because I failed University 101 and I didn't know what anthropology was until my senior year, which is why I got a degree in history and then a degree in education and then had to go back and find myself in anthropology. Um, so broadly, anthropology is the study of human life on Earth from its earliest origins to the modern day. We get to study everything. Um, it's different from history because history is about written records. Anthropology can go back before written records. Um, Different from sociology, because sociology is a lot about sort of contemporary class structure and anthropology can go out into the jungle where there's no such thing as a class hierarchy and study of a uh, society that is living in an extraordinarily different way from the way we live in, in Illinois. Um, it has four main subfields. There's cultural anthropology, um, which is the study of the way that human life varies across space and time and the way that human beings structure their interactions using culture. Um, it has archaeology, which is the study of societies, usually past societies, but not always, based on material objects that they create, use, and leave behind. So I could study the implications of this material object today, or I could study a bottle that was being used 10,000 years ago. Um, there's physical anthropology, which is the study of the evolution of human beings, physical variation in different regions and environments, 
and their bodies as the result of expressions of culture. So your body is not just what genetics says it's going to be, it's everything that you do during your life. And physical anthropology is interested in everything from nutrition to the annoying wear patterns that you get on your bones because you have to do the same job over and over. Um, and then linguistic anthropology is the study of ways that humans create a symbolic representation of the world. Um, we're learning more and more that other language, that other animals do use um, sim signals to communicate. And we learn more and more about the richness of that. Um, I think I heard recently that elephants have names for each other. Um, but human beings are par excellence, that's what we do. We construct this rich symbolic world and we swim in it all the time. Um, fun thing about anthropology though is that it gets richer. So there's also applied anthropology. How do you use anthropology to, to affect change in the real world? There's medical anthropology because it turns out that the definition of what's sick versus what's healthy can vary from culture to culture. Um, there's forensic anthropology, which is using kind of archeological techniques, but to understand basically past crime scenes and, and violent events. And there are probably more. Anthropology is a really big tent. Um, so yay anthropology, but what does it have to do with understanding a novel from the 1800s? So, I want to do sort of a weird thing here. I want to focus a little bit on Mary Shelley. Um, is this a pointer too? Does it work? Yeah. So Mary Shelley, who of course is the author of, of Frankenstein, um, and a woman named Ada Lovelace. Now they're kind of in the same family. Okay. So this is this is 19th century European sort of aristocracy, and it's glorious. Mary Shelley was the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin. She eventually married the poet Percy Shelley. William Godwin, after Mary Wollstonecraft died, married Mary Claremont, who had another daughter named Claire Claremont. So these two are stepsisters. Claire had an affair with Lord Byron, the poet. Um, and from that affair was born a daughter named Clara Byron. Byron had affairs with <laughs> basically everybody. Um, and he uh, also had an affair with Annabella Milbank, they actually married. They kind of got forced into it. Byron wasn't into the whole getting married thing. Um, so they stayed married a very brief time, then Byron left. Um, but from their union, Ada Lovelace was born. So Mary Shelley's stepsister's sort of step niece or something like that, depending on how, how you want to, to figure it. These are all part of, if not the same family, the same sort of social clique. Apparently Claire Claremont was instrumental in making sure that Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley could have a clandestine affair. So these folks all knew of one another, although there's no actual evidence that Mary Shelley met Ada Lovelace. So why Ada Lovelace? So Ada Lovelace was homeschooled and her mom was adamant about teaching her everything because she was afraid of what would happen to Lord Byron's kind of estranged daughter. So she sort of drilled her in everything that was known at the time about um, logic and science and, and math and literature and all the other wonderful things that you would get drilled in. Um, Ada Lovelace then was extremely smart, was extremely well trained, and fell in with a guy named Charles Babbage. Now Babbage was a smart guy. He had this idea for this thing called a difference engine. And a difference engine was basically a big system of cranks and levers that you could turn and it would do math. This was very exciting in the early 1800s. You can call it a, the first computer. Um, and Babbage was really interested in sort of the business end of this, right? Being able to calculate, you know, sums of things that are coming in and maybe rates of change at which things are, are being produced. It's very exciting stuff. But we need to remember Ada Lovelace because Ada Lovelace was, if Charles Babbage was smart, Ada Lovelace was a genius. Problem of course for Ada Lovelace is she was also female. So for a while she was sort of ignored and downplayed um, and forgotten. But when we've looked back at her notes and what she actually wrote about the potential for this difference engine, we can see that Babbage saw it as an engine, a crank that you could turn and get numbers out. Ada Lovelace saw it as a computer. Ada Lovelace is widely argued to have been the first person to write a computer program. Um, she designed algorithms. And if you look in her notebooks, you can see that she's talking about how to use this difference engine, not just to do math, not just to do sums, not just to bring in you know, more money or X, 
but she talked about how it could eventually be used in other domains, including literature and music. Ada Lovelace kind of saw the future coming in a way that Charles Babbage never did. Um, I don't have a big biography prepared about Ada Lovelace. Go look her up. She's a fascinating woman. Um, unfortunately, she, she was passionate about this project. She wanted the full difference engine to be built in all its glory. She kept trying to pursue funding for it. They could never get the money for it. She eventually decided the way to get the money was to beat the system by going down to the track and betting on the horses. She got herself in a, herself in a lot of debt. Um, from what I understand, she found really the only way to get out of debt, which was die young. Um, and it, in that sense, it's sort of a tragic story. Um, she died of one of the diseases like tuberculosis or something that, that was endemic at the time. Um, but during her young life, she was passionate about saying, we really need to build this difference engine and we really need to explore how it can work because it can do amazing things. So Ada Lovelace was right. Wrote the first computer program, wrote about what computers can do, knew that computers could do more than Babbage imagined. So the question is, have we been enacting Lovelace's dream, not Babbage's, for decades? But now the question that I want to ask is, are we also enacting Mary Shelley's? So you can see where I'm going with this. We're building artificial intelligence machines. Are we building a monster? <laughs> um, so I just have these little notes now and then. At any given time on a modern computer, there are dozens and perhaps even hundreds of little programs running utilities in the background that make sure that the whole computer is running right. And they're called demons. <laughs> so. What is artificial intelligence, the 2023 version? And I say the 2023 version because, frankly, it's changed. And it's changed a lot in just the last several years. Um, who here is exploring, using, playing with, whatever, chat GPT? That one over there? Can I ask what you use it for, what you play with, or just pass on it? Uh, I'm a, I'm an oh. I see. Ah, I see. Anybody else? Chat GPT? It's supposed to be the hot new thing. Everybody's supposed to be using it to write all their papers. Don't do that. <laughs> well, I mean, th that's the thing. So uh, I forget what's on my next slide. Um, Chat GPT barred these things called LLMs, these large language models, OK? They basically exist because when I start a sentence and I start going, putting words together in a sentence, you can eventually see what the next word will be. <laughs> you can predict the next word, right? If you happen to have access to the entire internet, you can look over all the sentences that everybody has ever written, and you can see that after the word will, there are several other words that come, but be is one of the most frequent. And if you look back a few words, you can see what the next word will the only word that can be there is B. And so it can predict the next word is B. The thing that they discovered really in the last couple of years is that if you look both directions in the sentence, sort of forward and backward, and you modify these probabilities extensively, you can actually start to predict not just the next word, but the word after that, and the word after that, and the word after that. And you can iterate over and over until you're generating long lines of text. And what they've gotten to in the last several years is that you can say, hey, who do you think was the greatest tennis player in the world? And it will say, it will assume that the prompt is the greatest tennis player in the world is, and it will start to fill in probabilistically. It will say, many people say Roger Federer, some people argue Novak Djokovic, and others argue Rafael Nadal, which is great. I mean, it's amazing. And you can say, write it in simpler language, and it will sort of downgrade it. It will use a different pool of probabilities. You can say, write it in a more complicated way. In that sense, it's kind of amazing. I'm going to argue it's also kind of boring, but it is kind of amazing. So let's see what else I have on this. Uh, let's, let's stick with this just for a minute. Um, even in my example, that's one that I used because I started playing with ChatGPT. Anybody have any idea what, I, what you might say is wrong with that example? Who's the greatest tennis player in the world? And the answers are Rafael Nadal, Novak Djokovic, and Roger Federer. Um, but opinions vary. That's basically the answer gave me. Any problems? Serena Williams, anybody? I mean, Serena Williams has like as many championships as, as, as the guys. 
Um, she was much more dominant in her area. So the difficulty is deciding whether that answer is sexist or also kind of racist. Um, the, the way they train these models drinks in the internet and it figures out the probabilities, but then it kind of answers back with what's the average look like. I'm gonna argue that getting the average right isn't really very interesting. It's nice that it can put together this flowery text and all that, but I'm not, I'm not down for it. So let's put it that way. Um, so question, the book that we're looking at, what's it about? Okay, that's sort of a broad question. So I'll, I'll lead you a little bit. The book could be about the monster. Everybody thinks about the monster. But that's not the title of the book. The book is about Frankenstein the doctor or the learned scholar or whoever. It's about what's going on in his mind, how he deals with the thing that he created. The monster is actually kind of less interesting um, than Frankenstein and all of his agonies about what he should and shouldn't do and how he's dealt with it. And so Mary Shelley was very keen when she named it, named the book Frankenstein because it's not about the monster. The subtitle of the book is The Modern Prometheus. Um, who's Prometheus? Somebody over there said it. Yeah, so Prometheus is the Greek god who gave man fire, gave man technology, right? Lifted man up from being just a beast into whatever it is supposed to be. Blame him for a lot of problems in the world, but also that's the way it worked. Um, so Mary Shelley was writing about the role that Victor Frankenstein is playing. So what does this talk about? So this talk could be about AI. But I think it's not. I think it's really about the people who create, use, and interact with AI. The AI technology is sort of glorious, right? It kind of mines this huge data set. It comes up with this very clever party trick of assembling words after words after words in a way that looks like human speech and text. But what I'm interested in is how are we interacting with it? How are we using it? How and why did we create it? Um, and so let's talk about that the way an anthropologist would be interested in talking about it, or at least this anthropologist. Um, if you were talking about AI, you'd get into all kinds of questions like, how does AI work? Probably do a better job of summarizing it than I just gave you, but um, you'd have questions like, can I AI be sentient? So this thing that's giving back these answers, is it alive in some way? Is it thinking? Does it know about itself? Um, what are the ethics of AI? Um, AI, overall positive or negative, which I'm kind of interested in your view on. AI, something that's positively gonna influence the world, negatively gonna influence the world. More people leaning negative looks like. Um, mixture of both, so I guess I'm asking on a net, right? Um, so on the one hand, uh, I'm able to drive from point A to point B and the AI can guide me. That's how I got here today. On the downside, I have to avoid the roving bands of gangs in the post-apocalyptic wasteland that it, got, that it created. Um, so, and questions about can AI create art? Now, some of those questions I actually think can be brought over to the other side, um, but I'm also interested in why was AI created? How is it being used and by whom? And how does it relate to our notion of our humanity? By the way, I should mention, I always take the uh, Microsoft suggested slide layout. So if you get little funny robots, it's because that's what it offered and I'm like, let's do it. Uh, every now and then you get a unicorn jumping a cupcake and it's glorious. Um, so um, the first thing that Frankenstein created I found this really interesting. First of all, I found it interesting that it happened so early in the book. But second of all, the very first thing that he created was a man. That was his, that's just like starter project, right? He didn't create a garden slug first. He's like, hey, I can give life to inanimate things. Let's build a man. But what's interesting is he didn't build some kind of animal. He didn't build a woman. And in fact, later on in the book, he tries to build a woman and a woman turns out to be harder to build. I thought that was interesting. He didn't try to build initially something more than a human, and he didn't try to build something to do a specific task. He built a reflection of himself, in other words. Um, Victor creates his monster, then abandons him, leaving him alone to try to survive in the world. Thanks, Dad. 
Uh, there's a certain amount of this whole 18th century aristocracy, Lord Byron leaving his kids behind kind of thing going on in the book, having to do with how you treat your own creations. Um, it's kind of a sidelight. Uh, but this is an interesting question to me because it turns out humans have been trying to create artificial humans for a long time. Um, We've been doing it for a very long time. There's another Greek myth, Pygmalion, about a guy who builds a statue that is so lifelike that it is able to come to life. Um, there's also this sort of thing about our image of the gods, right? So if you think in some cultures, gods are not humans. They are beasts like uh, the, the, I don't know, the, I'm not gonna get it right. Osiris is the, um, is that the one with the head of the dog or something? But there are these, these gods that are not strictly human. Um, Egyptian gods, particularly in, in uh, Central America, the gods are not human at all. Um, and yet, in some other cultures, the gods are human, and, the, and humans are in, explicitly said to be built as a reflection of gods, when in fact it kind of was the other way. Um, human beings are also sort of, we recognize patterns even when patterns aren't there. That's kind of what we do, it's our thing. Um, so this pareidolia is the recognition of patterns or the, the tendency to recognize patterns even when the patterns aren't present. But another thing that we do is we tend to think of things in human terms even if they're not human. So we attribute an agency, a humanness to forces in the natural world even when they are not human beings. Um, we can talk, and this can be everything from referring to boats as she to um, trying to understand uh, um, what is the intent, what is the meaning of the actions of a river, for example. Um, and I put this, is this irresistible? Because there actually is a, a recent anthropology article that says that it's absolutely irresistible, that these, these you know, Siri and Alexa and things that we can talk to and, and interact with that we just sort of have a natural affinity to that. And this worries me a little bit because I have very little interest in it myself. Um, and I sometimes think that it's because of, honestly, it's sort of a generational thing. I grew up when a computer was a thing that you could take apart and put together and I still think of them that way. So I'm not about to consider Siri like a person because I could take Siri apart. <laughs> it's, I can't do that with a person. Um, so there's this sort of discussion about how do we consider these bits of wire and speakers as human? Um, and what does it mean that we keep trying to build things that act and seem like humans out of uh, these wires? Um, now, this is the 2023 version. We have ChatGPT. Um, we have this notion of bi-directional attention, which is looking both ways in the sentence that caused this huge leap in, in what artificial intelligence can do. This is a little bit earlier. Yes, it's Wikipedia, do as I say, not, I, not as I do, but um, there's a robot called Sophia. And if you notice, uh, in October 2017, Sophia was granted Saudi Arabian citizenship, becoming the first robot to receive legal personhood in any country. So they decided Sophia would get to be a citizen, um, which I presume means that she has the rights of a citizen in Saudi Arabia. Um, She's also a woman, so some of those are going to be less than had she been built as a male, maybe, I don't know. Um, but the point is, there was this move a few years ago to start talking about, should we be giving robots citizenship? I don't know what would happen if you upgraded Sophia's software with ChatGPT, um, but presumably that's a possibility. Uh, let's see. So here's another reason why I'm not particularly interested in ChatGPT. Um, so there's this notion of text, stream of words, versus speech acts. So anthropologists and linguists identify what are called speech acts. What is a speech act? These are instances where the utterance of a phrase carries a social meaning. By the power vested in me by the state of Illinois, I now pronounce you I thought about having a couple of people stand up here and I could say, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today, et cetera, et cetera. But the key is, I imagine that I could make them get very uncomfortable. <laughs> but the, the key is, 
I don't actually have any power vested in me by the state of Illinois. It's completely meaningless. It would be like reading lines at a play. It's not a speech act. But in a different context, with a different person, with different people participating at a specific time, that speech act, I now pronounce you husband and husband, has a specific social meaning. It carries forward in time. It changes the social structure that we're interested in. It's trivial to generate the text for that. We all know how it goes. We could all write it down. We could all recite it. What matters is, did it happen at the right time? Did it happen with the right speaker? Did it happen with the right context? Yeah, I did that backwards. So another question. What is this, what is this thing that we're calling intelligence? Um, I feel like I feel like I could ask what intelligence is, but it's really broad because it's everything from knowing a large collection of facts. That's what that's something an intelligent person knows. Um, being able to recall facts very quickly. There's also mathematical intelligence, being able to figure out complex problems. There's logical intelligence. Um, but in fact, this question of what is intelligence can vary and it's shifted through time. Um, We've tended to use behave like a human to mean intelligent. And in fact, there's this thing called the Turing test, which says basically, if I can't tell the difference between the responses a computer is giving and the responses a person is giving, then I have to say that the computer is intelligent. Um, math used to be considered the highest intelligence. Winning at chess was big for a while until they built a computer that can beat everybody. Um, Imitating human speech is sort of considered the final, the final frontier, which I choose deliberately because if you watch the old episodes of Star Trek, they interact with the computer and they'll say, you know, can you bring up the record from, or you know, what's the, what's the travel time to this star? And the computer will say, working. And then it'll say, you know, 14 hours, 53 minutes at warp nine. And what's hilarious is that the calculation for the warp time, that's trivial. Understanding the spoken question that's amazing. But in the 1960s, that was considered a given. The math was considered harder. Um, so does the way we interact with each other affect our idea of intelligence? And this I kind of want to just float. We're much more comfortable now interacting via text than we were a few years ago. Um, and I kind of wonder what we expect our AI to do based on how we interact with each other. It sort of shifts a little bit. Um, I loved those letters at the beginning of Frankenstein because we don't, we don't get a lot of letters like that anymore. Instead, you'll get like a text message. Um, and that shapes what we think our artificial intelligence should be able to do t for us. And I also have this question here. Um, I want to float this, this concept. I won't say it, but this BS concept. So, what does it mean to tell the truth? To tell the truth means I know a fact in the real world and I state that fact correctly because I believe it is important to speak the correct fact. What does it mean to lie? To lie means I know the correct fact and I say something different because I want to mislead. I want to present the appearance that that fact is not true. But there's also another sort of category which is a philosopher wrote this, BS, which is where you say facts or you say things without any concern or knowledge of whether they're true or not. You just start rattling things off. The important thing is that you're talking. <laughs> Sometimes the important thing is that you're getting attention. Sometimes the important thing is that you're distracting from something else. But you could be saying something that's true. You could be saying something that's false. It just doesn't matter. I'm afraid that if I reached for examples in our contemporary world, I could find lots of them right now. But the interesting thing is, what does that say about how we assess ChatGPT? ChatGPT neither knows nor cares what's true. It just strings together text, and now we call that intelligent. Uh, let's see what else I put. By the way, again, different kinds of intelligence, and this is what Microsoft comes up with. <laughs> somebody writing these gigantic math equations. Um, so in art anthropologists are actually interested in lots of different kinds of intelligence. One of them is embodied intelligence and embodied knowledge. 
I said that your physical self, your body, has the imprint of you doing work over and over built into it, along with your history of nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that contains a kind of knowledge. Everything from knowledge of traditional dances, knowledge of how to communicate with people in person, um, knowledge of how to navigate through places and spaces. Um, there's knowledge written into the external world around us as well. So where is the locus of knowledge for our culture, for our society? It's not necessarily all here. We build it into the environment. This is incidentally one of the reasons why self-driving cars is a even though they haven't pulled it off yet, it's still a reasonable place to start because cars don't have to drive in a landscape that is like the terrain of Mars. We have heavily structured our entire world to have lanes and signs and lights that all direct every, all the cars around. So we've externalized a lot of that knowledge and built it into our real world. So if anthropologists are interested in knowledge that exists in very different ways and in very different um, formats, then calling ChatGPT sort of a groundbreaking artificial intelligence technology is bypassing all of this. Uh, let's see. Um, now I want to mention a couple of other things. I mentioned, you know, was the Serena Williams re example racist or sexist? Um, these, yeah, these, these um, large language models have read data from all over the internet and they reflect it back. And one of the big problems with it is that data all over the internet is not what we would aspire to be. It contains lots of instances of bias, lots of instances of um, uh, racial, ethnic, gender, sex, discrimination. It's actually, there's actually a connection to the, uh, the comment I made earlier about building a woman is a lot harder. So Frankenstein builds a man. He studied anatomy, so he knows how to build a man, but then when he gets the, uh, the directive from the monster to build a woman, he has to go study again. Um, he has to go do lots and lots of research. Today, there is a bias in the medical information that we have that is collected largely on male populations, historically, and women's healthcare, medical anthropology, lags behind, still today. Some there are some pragmatic reasons for that. During certain portions of their lives, you would not want to be doing medical tests on women when they are, for example, carrying children. But the reality is that it was just sort of male is the default. If you understand men, then you can just sort of extend to women. The idea that women are <laughs> deserving of, of uh, an understanding of their own or maybe even the place that you should have started because if you can understand a woman, men are simpler never occurred to, to the medical profession. And in fact, a lot, of, a lot of what we would call today medicine was pushed to the fringes during the more Victorian periods of medicine. Um, and that has shaped knowledge of women's reproductive health, et cetera. And all of this is still living in the data that we swim in. And all of this is still being scooped up by these large language models. And all of this can still be spat out by ChatGPT. And would you consider that sort of advancing intelligence or just echoing back the problems that we've already had? Which brings me to something that anthropologists are incredibly focused on right now because it both elevates the field of anthropology and condemns it. And that is this legacy of colonialism. So, I was surprised also in, in Frankenstein to see references to what was going on in the Americas and weeping for the deaths of the people in the Peruvian and Mexican empires, which was, of course, a thing. Um, the original picture that we had of um, North America at contact when Christopher Columbus showed up as largely empty with sort of scattered tribes of Native Americans turns out very wrong. Um, that picture developed about 30 or 40 years later after diseases had decimated the Native Americans. What you were seeing was a population that had lost, some people estimate, 90% of its population. If 90% of the population is gone, what you're looking at is not a reflection of the way it was before. Um, and so 
this reference to colonialism in Frankenstein I found sort of touching. Um, but it turns out it goes so much deeper than that. Um, so uh, my good friends who study economics study largely Western economics that came from Western Europe. There were lots of other economic systems that existed around the world, but you can't make money off of those, so they kind of got destroyed. And now economics claims that it's sort of the answer to how economics works, when in fact it's the answer to how one particular kind of economics works. Um, anthropologists are interested in, um, uh, let's see, I say the way Western conceptions of intelligence, wisdom of justice, also non-Western conceptions of intelligence, wisdom, and justice. I was, the direction I was going there was how the Western conceptions sort of mask a lot of the non-Western conceptions. Um, Western science has actually devalued these other approaches. Um, and I don't know why Microsoft looked at that and said, let's do one collection of chess army pieces over a fallen opponent. Um, the problem then, so if we sort of write everything in terms of colonialism spread across the world and kind of imposed and destroyed particular conceptions of intelligence, we get to a question that I think is interesting, which is, what if intelligence isn't the average of everything that we've got now, but it's actually the different stuff? So chat GPT and other tools predict what an answer could look like, fine. But what if intelligence is, I would use the term, historically particular? Historically particular means that it's grounded in a time and a place and a set of people. What if being intelligent isn't being able to speak, it isn't just being able to speak, it's being able to say the right what at the right when while being the right who among the right whom and arriving at the right why. It's intelligence is manufactured by the activity of people as they are exchanging ideas, as they are building new things, not just as they're spitting back what was collected over the internet over the last 20 years. And one thing that's interesting is that this is also related to the way that anthropologists conceive of power. How do you construct power? You construct power out of the pieces that exist in a particular time and place. I can't give you a formula for how you take over the world because the way you take it over in 2025 and if you have good intentions, maybe someone should, um, is going to be different from the way it was taken over in um, 2015, 2016, something like that. The pieces are different. Um, the way we communicate with each other is different. And intelligence and power might be more about understanding the differences, more about building new things than about spitting these things back. So. What do I have next? So I'm getting close to the end of time, and I want to ask one sort of weird question. What's up with the speech at the end, right? So, so they're on the boat, and uh, Waldman's crew is going to mutiny, right? And they march in, and they say, dude, <laughs> the ice is closing in on us. we got to get out of here. Um, and Waldman's like, no, we got to go to the North Pole. That's why we're here. And they're like, no, no, man. <laughs> we're done with this. And Frankenstein stands up and gives this inspirational speech, right? I felt like it came out of nowhere. What is it, why does anybody think that that speech was there? Remember, the speech is all about, no, you were set to a purpose. You have to stick to that purpose. This is how we push science forward. And eventually, the crew is like, OK, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll do it for a while longer. Um, why did Shelley put that speech in there? I'm sorry? Um, yeah, so there's a nice connection. So, so um, what she was saying for the microphone for the recording was, it's like Ada Lovelace. You can push forward. You can do more than there was before. So my question is, is Shelley actually for that? <laughs> because the whole message is a little bit mixed. So I actually think that that's a really good connection um, because artificial intelligence is being promoted by Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg and the likes of them. 
the whole people who brought us the move fast and break stuff philosophy. The question is, is it really going to do all the things that they say? Is it going to save the world? Or are they just building it and going to see what happens? Um, I think that Shelley is kind of ambiguous about this point um, because I think that she recognizes that there's this thrust to advance science and yet also saying, you know, <laughs> eventually the crew turns back, right? <laughs> eventually they're like, you know, the North Pole is going to be nice, but we want to go home. We want to be with our families. Let's, let's, let's try it next time. Um, and I think when we look at all that's being promoted about artificial intelligence, that it's going to solve you know, all these problems in healthcare and all these problems in traffic and urban form and all this other stuff, we have to actually ask, do they have the evidence for that? Or are they just sort of casting the dice and seeing what happens? Um, even worse, are the dice loaded, right? So if we're looking at the after effects of this sort of expansion of colonialism that has drowned out all the myriad different ways that you could build a city, all the myriad different ways that you could run an economy, and instead you're sort of mashing it up and making it all the same, which is kind of what these large language models do, is it really the way forward? Is it going to help us adapt to a changing climate? Is it really going to help us find peaceful um, ways of moving forward, um, resolving conflicts, et cetera? I'm not sure anybody really knows. I think they're just kind of gambling. Again, the views in this talk do not represent Argonne National Laboratory or any other institution. Um, who has the power as AI progresses? And this is one of the interesting things because if I ask Siri, hey Siri, how do I get to Argonne? You know, it'll give me directions. What would you trust AI to do? Would you trust AI to make a decision in a court case you were in? Are you guilty? Are you innocent? Would you trust AI to make a decision about whether you should be allowed out on, on parole? Because AI is being used for that right now. And the argument is it's more fair than a judge because it, you know, judges have been shown to have these biases against particular racial and ethnic groups. So let's use the AI, it can be impartial. If the data are, are impartial, which they often are not. Where do we give these artificial intelligence tools the power where do we say not only, hey, I think this is intelligence, I think it might be human, perhaps another citizen, perhaps it might even be able to make decisions better than we can make them. How do we keep giving these things power? And should we? Because you can also just say, yeah, you're a bunch of wires and ignore it. And it can spit out all the text at once. But I'm not a bunch of wires, but I have an inner life. Please help me. Yeah. Um, so the last thing that I will say is second Tuesday in October is Ada Lovelace Day. It's coming up soon. Um, it's a day which honors the achievements of women in science, and this year is October 10th. And it's especially important to make sure that you, don't, that you remember women in science and you don't let men overshadow them. Um, also, October 10th is my birthday. But don't let men overshadow you. Um, and that's really all I have. I want to leave some time for questions and comments and conversation. How about a round of applause? Okay. All right, so we'll open up for questions. To get us started, we'll start back here. Hi, thank you very much. Um, you also have a career planning class here today, and I, so I wanted you to spend a few minutes talking about careers in AI, and I was surprised to learn your doctorate was in anthropology. <laughs> um, and so how did you make the shift? So if you wouldn't mind spending a few minutes um, sure. talking to my class about careers in the field? Sure. Um, so I started off saying that I failed University Survey 101. I didn't fail it. I got a U in it. It's unsatisfactory. Um, and then I got a history degree. And then I went into education. Did that at an awful time. Teaching jobs were impossible. Um, and then I discovered anthropology and I got very interested in it. And I genuinely believe that anthropology is a different way of looking at the world. It's an extremely valuable way. It's not a way that receives a lot of funding right now, and it's sort of disappearing, but it's, I think, critical. But careers are weird. Um, I have never, well, 
the last computer class that I took, and remember, computational engineer is my official job title. The last computer class that I took was Computers 2 in Lakewood High School on an Apple IIe. Everything else is self-taught. Um, I got interested in computer simulation modeling because it answered questions that I had. And it turns out that I'm pretty handy at it. So I ended up at Argonne in a sort of weird place because my division is decision and infrastructure sciences. We look at adaptation to climate change and we'll use any tool we can get. Um, computer modeling happens to be the tool that I use. Um, I don't have any glorious advice about um, how to position yourself to be involved in AI. I think that that's a very fast moving uh, environment. Um, as I said, just a few years ago, they discovered this, um, this bi-directional attention mechanism looking not only forward but backwards across the sentences. They've been plugging this generative approach that sort of asks, how close did you come? Can you get closer if you change this? Try again. And because it can happen thousands and thousands of times in a second, it can get really good at doing things like creating pictures. Honestly, I do not know where that's going to be, let's say, four years when people are graduating. Um, get good at math, get good at computer programming, and you can, can ride it forward. Um, there's an awful lot of data management that has to go into it. Um, these are very, very large data sets, and if you're dealing with petabytes of data, just being able to move them back and forth across the network is amazing. Um, but where that field is going as a whole, I don't exactly know. I think, though, I would also say be looking for applications, be looking for where people are using AI and how they're using it. And if you can use the AI tools that are being produced rather than having to create them, then you would have a leg up going into, um, I don't know, uh, any sort of business that has any need for prediction, which most of them do. Um, many businesses that have a need for um, automating some part of interaction with clients or customers. Um, there's an awful lot of that stuff going on. So that's maybe the best that I can do about sort of careers in AI and careers in computers. All right, thanks. Other questions? I will come to you. Yes. So one is, can you tell me about the Turing, Turing test you mentioned? Sure. I couldn't really see, and I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Sure. One. So Alan Turing, um, who was a brilliant mathematician, um, came up with this thing called the Turing test. And basically, at the time, computers were sort of teletype things. Right? Um, and so what he proposed is that if you were sitting in a room, and there was like a little divider, and you knew something was on the other side of this divider, and you could type a message to that something, and it would go in and you'd get a message back. If you couldn't tell whether the thing that was responding to you was a human being or a computer, and it turned out it was a computer, then you would have to say that that computer was intelligent. Um, so you ask it questions, it gives you answers back. If you can't tell the difference, what's the difference? And you could make an argument, well, you know, I'm an anthropologist, so human beings are you know, mostly water and a bunch of proteins and stuff. They're very different from computers. But Turing's argument was, in terms of intelligence, you don't really know what's going on inside any person's brain. If you're getting back the same things from a machine, then that machine must be intelligent. That's the notion of the Turing test. But it, if the machine doesn't say LOL at the end, then we know it's probably a, a machine, because everything's going to end in something. I mean, I think that, that In some ways, it's a very difficult test to argue against, right? Because if it does say LOL, if it does say emojis, I mean, there are, um, there are some of these chat things that come back with emojis and can really simulate. So you, it, you would have a hard time knowing that you're not interacting with a human being. I think my problem with it is that they're still not human beings. Um, they may be whatever you want to call intelligent. But they lack a lot of the things that I think are actually important about being a human being. Um, and I guess maybe just to sort of sort of dodge the question, but also um, be a little bit, I don't know, romantic or nostalgic, 
the really hard problem is creating a world full of human beings who are good human beings who have an opportunity for life and who have an opportunity to make the world better for others and to enjoy their lives themselves. That's a hard problem. Building a machine that can answer questions? Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah. Like when you get into metaverse and stuff, I'm like, this is, I'm not even going down that road. But my other question was about, like you mentioned, like Elon Musk and them talking about like move fast and break stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, is that kind of like shooting in the dark? But when I think about research in general, isn't that kind of like how research, even medical research was built with like, this is what we think. We're just going to go out there and cut somebody open or, or whatever it may be. Right. And, but then now we just add ethics to it and say, let's just try not to harm as much. So it's like what like there's a fine. I'm struggling with that a bit because it's like, what's the difference? almost? Yeah. So. Um, in some ways, I think you're right. In some ways, you know, it's always let's try something. And there maybe isn't as much thought put in as should be as to whether this is really a good idea. You know, every now and then you see a headline like researchers have thought out a 40,000 year old virus. And it's like, really researchers? Do you think that that's a good idea? Um, and so you, you kind of say, well, maybe not. Um, but there is also right now a a mythology around tech companies. Tech companies get tons and tons of money and they all claim they're the smartest people in the world and they're going to do these things that are going to solve all of these problems. Um, so I read an article, there's a wonderful writer named Naomi Klein. She wrote an article about all the claims for artificial intelligence. And one of the things she mentioned is that there's this guy out there who's saying artificial intelligence is going to solve all the world's problems, it's going to resolve climate change, it's going to be great. And it's like, okay, so that 10,000 acres in a bunker that you have in the center of California that's stocked with bottled water, antibiotics, and dry goods, what's that for? <laughs> and, and it's like, yeah, okay. And so I am very hesitant because I think ultimately, and I was mentioning this you know, before I started talking, there are a lot of people who are trained. So I'm, I do computational social science. There are a lot of people who are trained in computer stuff. There are far fewer who are trained in social science. All the computer people, and many of the computer people, not all, um, believe that they can do social science because they find a pattern, they find some mathematical equation, they fit it into the world, and they say we're done. But they don't think about the ethics, they don't think about the theory, they don't think about the research methods that would actually allow you to learn about how people are living their lives. You can make a ton of money doing that, but is it really making the world better the way that these people say? Is there any regulation in that? I'm sorry. Um, well, there's an ethical issue right now. For example, um, these chat GPT and everything, they're just reading in everything from the internet. They don't have permission to read everything from the internet. Technically, what they're doing is they're making derivative works, right? They're, in, they're intruding on the copyright of the people, and they're getting sued for it. Um, and that's really interesting. So if you type into chat GPT something about, you know, who was this character on Game of Thrones, and it comes back with, what's the language, Dothraki or something like that, there is no way that it could know that without having some of the text that George R.R. R. Martin created. And he did not give them permission to use that text. So essentially, these people are just stealing all of this data. Um, stealing is maybe a strong word. But you could argue that that's what they're doing. And is it regulated? Nobody knows how to regulate it part of the problem. Just a quick commercial. If you want to learn more about Alan Turing, we have many good books in the library. And the movie Imitation Game with yes. Benedict Cumberbatch is all about his life. So I'm um, really interesting. I had another question for you. So you said, um, like, we're creating these um, to think of these things in human terms, right? Uh -huh. But don't you think the opposite is also happening where we're putting all these additional expectations on humans because of AI, right? In the sake of efficiency, in the sake of everything else. So I feel like when we talk about colonialism, like AI continues in many ways to perpetuate colonialistic tendencies. Mm -hmm. And it is also imposing and putting different expectations on us as humans. Can you speak to that? What are your thoughts about that? Um, I, I guess I would ask maybe for, for a little more about an example of an expectation that's being put on people by AI. Well, not by AI, but or us as humans, us, yeah. we see these expectations like, okay, we need to 
I think about retail, I think about different places where like, okay, we want to produce more, right? So mm -hmm. we want to, so we're asking humans as well to be more efficient, to be more productive, right? To okay. take out the human aspect mm -hmm. because in our mind, being efficient actually, or I thought one of the things I thought about was objectivity, which as human mm -hmm. beings, we cannot really be objective because we're humans, right? Mm -hmm. But we impose all of that um, on ourselves as human beings. And I think, I wonder if AI is also playing an additional role in that. Um, I think, yeah. Um, I think that the push toward things like efficiency, the, the, the manufacturing of consumers is something that has been a part of the capitalist game for a long time. I mean, you think Google gave all those computers out for free just because they're good people? They're manufacturing consumers of Google products going forward. Um, and I think that the push for efficiency and you know, all of the things that are, I, all, of the, all the things that I think you're thinking of, I think that that's real. And I think that it is gonna change the way we interact with each other and what expectations are put on people. And there isn't as much of a concern about what kind of a world are we building if we, if we made it possible to replace, you know, 50% of the jobs in this country with AI. That could be great if 50% of the people can then have great lives and not have to worry about going to work at the factory every day. But that's not probably what's going to happen. It's probably going put to be put toward a different purpose. Um, and so, yeah, all of that sort of plays in. And I think AI, AI is going to make it faster because AI is building, being built to do that. Okay. Not at Argonne. We actually are trying to use AI at Argonne some to do good things. Argonne is, Argonne is a nonprofit. So we try to, uh, try to make the world better. Well, maybe that's a good stopping point. How about a round of applause for Dr. Murphy? Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Have a great day. Really quick, College 101, Miss Yusuf's College 101 and my class, HDV, we're actually going to go over to U111 now um, for a mental health awareness programming that's taking place. So you can meet us there in U111 until